Thank you for waiting. We're sorry for the delay um, with the technology. There are four of us on the panel today. Um, myself, I'm Alana from Durham. Um, to my left is Antonio from Leeds. And to my right is Anna from the OU and Kate from Southampton University. So we're going to introduce to you four um, quite different projects related to OER and languages. And we will be going up to the lectern to show you different websites and um, just to demonstrate different resources. Um, but we would like this to be an interactive session um, further along after we've done a basic intro to get a sense of the types of language OER that you might have encountered or perhaps the types of issues that um, confront teachers and learners of languages um, who might be trying to go the open route. So we're going to start off with Anna from the OU, and she's going to introduce the LORO, the Languages Open Repository, open repository open resources online. online. Yeah. Yes. OK, so just to explain what LORO is, LORO is a <coughs> repository of language teaching resources uh, created at the Open University with GISC fun funding. Um, it was created between 2009 and 2010, um, it wasn't a very big project, it was just one of those startup <coughs> projects. A little, little bit of money went a long way. <laughs> and um, we had a very specific case. We had a department of languages with over 300 language tutors and not, we didn't have an efficient way of sharing resources. Um, we put normally things in a tutor section in the uh, Moodle um, workspace and uh, tutors just picked up the resources they needed for their, for their face to face and online tutorials from their course uh, website. That meant the tutors could only access the resources for the courses that they taught. So if I taught beginner Spanish, I didn't know what was happening in beginner's German or in beginner's French. And I didn't know what was happening in advanced Spanish. Okay, so we needed a system that would allow us to um, have all these materials shared in a way that everybody could see everything, but also that it wasn't just the institution passing on materials to the tutors, but there was a way of bringing back whatever the tutors were creating into the community of language tutors. So this is what we came up with. Um, down in Southampton, this uh, technology, this platform had been developed, <coughs> ePrints, mainly for research repositories, and then they were trying it with educational um, resources. And there was a number of language-related projects, and one, one of them was ours, the Laura one. What we tried to do was make it, it was a bit of a journey as well, in that we started with a very simple problem, um, and we thought Laura would be a good solution to that problem. And as we learned more about it, we realized about openness, we realized about putting things out there, and all sorts of other things that went with creating this repository. So there's been like a development, not just of what the repository is, but of our thinking. To start with, we thought we will put that inside the intranet. And even to our institution, that was more acceptable. Than, think, than saying we would put it out there in the open. So there's been like a progression in us learning about it, the institution <coughs> becoming more accepting of it, and also our tutors getting their head around the idea that things are there. Um, one of the things we did in Loro is make it really, really easy for our tutors who were the main customers for this repository to start with. So we made it very easy for them to find the materials they needed. So if they taught advanced Spanish, just a click away, they had all the advanced Spanish materials. You know? So it, is, it was initially primarily organized so that it would be of maximum uh, benefit to the community at the Open University. But in doing that, we released about 360 hours of content for language teaching on seven languages, French, Spanish, Italian, German, Welsh, Chinese, and English for academic purposes. And we also started looking at communities and whether we had a community, whether it was really a community or, or it was more like a group of people. Our, all our tutors are part-time tutors. So there is this issue of 
working part-time for an institution, being quite isolated. And we started to view the repository not just as an OER resource, but as a hub that could just be the centre of some kind of conversations amongst our teachers. Um, so I think that's what I'll say about Loro. Um, since, since we launched it, it's had more than a million hits and it's, you know, it's done quite well, even though we haven't had really the resources to push it or, you know, take over the world or anything like that, you know. It's not been like that. It's done, it's doing the function that it was designed to do and a bit more. And I think the bit more is, is the bonus, really. Um, so I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about it um, later and I'll just leave the next person now. Hello, I'm Kate. I'm from a research enterprise group called the Centre for uh, Languages, Linguistics and Area Studies, which is based at the University of Southampton. And for about five years or so, we've been involved in various projects uh, with language teachers, different groups of language teachers, looking at issues around sharing open educational resources. And I want to tell you about one particular project, uh, which is called the Community Cafe Project. Um, now this project has finished now, it ran last year and it was a collaboration between the University of Southampton, Southampton City Council and actually Manchester Metropolitan University. And this project sought to work with community-based language teachers. So these are teachers that work in perhaps Saturday schools or supplementary schools who work outside the mainstream educational system and they're delivering language classes to different groups of students. And in Hampshire, for example, there are 17 different languages taught to GCSE level in this kind of format. Now, these teachers have particular issues. Uh, usually, they don't have much teacher training. Uh, they work full-time. They have a, a normal life, a full-time job, or, or their housewives or house husbands. Uh, and they have family commitments. So they have very little time. Uh, they have very little access to resources, they don't have the support offered in the mainstream educational sector. And so we felt they would really benefit from the open access movement um, because the amount of resources available to these teachers would be increased. And also they could begin to network with each other uh, through sharing their resources um, on our platform, The Language Box, and meeting other tutors. So that was our aim, that they should have access to more resources, and to have access to uh, the work of other teachers in their language areas. And I'm sure you can imagine if there's a teacher in Hampshire, for example, there's one teacher of Somali, uh, and she really, really wanted good resources, up-to-date resources, and also to meet other teachers of Somali working elsewhere in the UK. Um, and these teachers are very isolated. So that was our project. Um, so we sought to uh, address these issues by working in two ways with them. We had informal cafe sessions, the community cafe, which were very sociable and a lot of fun, where we'd come together, the teachers would talk to each other and share experience cross-language group, which is quite unusual for them. They don't usually meet and do that. Um, and then these informal sessions were complemented by formal ICT training workshops given by us at the university. Um, and in these workshops, they would learn new skills, and they'd create material and then publish them onto the Language Box site. <coughs> and so that was our project, which ran for a year. Um, at the end of the year, we'd learnt an awful lot about the needs of these teachers, um, and we found that they were a really enthusiastic group, very, very keen to share, had none of the worries about sharing that I commonly meet when I talk to lecturers in higher education. Um, but some of the issues they had were actually around pedagogy and about understanding perhaps how to reflect on their teaching because they'd never done that before and how to convey those issues in a way that we need to do when we engage with the open world. For example, thinking about metadata and descriptions. Um, so that's a little snapshot of uh, my project and I'll talk more about it later. On to the next one. Hello everybody, uh, good afternoon. My name is Antonio Martinez Arboleda. Uh, and uh, I got into OERs through the Homebox 
um, in the year 2009. And, and since then, I've been working in uh, several projects uh, related to language, but also related to um, modern cultures, uh, history, politics, all to do with open educational resources. And I'm going to um, tell you briefly about one of the projects in which I'm involved, in which actually uh, Kate is heavily involved because she's the program manager. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's called Open Lives. <clears throat> it's uh, learning insights from the voices of emigres from Spain. Um, one of our colleagues in the project, Alicia Pozo Gutierrez from the University of Southampton, um, carried out a um, really a fascinating research uh, about the histories or the stories of uh, people who left Spain during the 40s, the 50s, the 60s for different reasons. And uh, she has 30 interviews, uh, oral history, uh, of about an hour each. Mm, they all more or less follow the same structure. And uh, one of the objectives of this program is actually to digitalize all those interviews uh, and make them available as super educational resources. Um, obviously, in, you know, uh, we have to do much more than that. And uh, I'm involved in, in another aspect of the project, which is creating learning resources um, to give those interviews the maximum possible use in different communities of users, not only for language, but for sociology, geography, history, economy, um, because they are really fascinating and rich resources that can be approached from many different subjects. And uh, so as part of the project, we are going to create uh, a number of uh, suites of open educational resources, which will be in the home box. And uh, also we are going to introduce those uh, learning materials and some of the activities into our own learning and teaching in our own institution. So for instance, I'm going to offer next year a module in final year Spanish uh, in which students will have to work through interviews, developing their research skills. They will have to use those interviews and those research skills to produce their own research. And finally, they will have to create their own podcast in the form of an open education resource and you know, put all that knowledge that they have taken from the repository and taken from the materials back into the community. Uh, and it's a module on Spanish language and culture, but obviously there is a lot of uh, content there because they'll have to learn about the history, they have to interpret the interviews that they work with, uh, and there are a lot of skills, research skills primarily, but also professional skills producing your own podcast. So um, those are the two aspects of my involvement in the project, mm, creation of, uh, that mod the creation of that module and uh, putting that into practice, and the development of these uh, learning suites with open education resources. And I think I will have an opportunity to talk more about how we're going to do this uh, OERs later. Huh? So, <laughs> right. So that's all. That's all. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alana. Um, I'm based up at Durham University. Um, but I've also been a SCORE fellow with the OU. And my area has been looking at open resources, um, particularly in English for academic purposes. But I do have a background um, in general ELT. And just three weeks ago, I was up in Glasgow at the really huge IA TEFL conference. So that's the International Association of TEFL. 2,500 people at the conference. Uh, you walk into the main area and it's just full of publisher stands selling um, yet more textbooks, teaching the same grammar points, the same Lexus, slightly different images, all copyrighted. It's just a flooded market of resources that are essentially the same. And they have been pretty much the same for the 10, 15 years that I've been in the field. Um, there are some projects within ELT that have started to go towards open. Uh, there's one called English 360 that's working with publishers to release content and allow teachers to mash it up. So 
that's just one example. So I guess for myself, my own motivation for being involved in open educational resources for language teaching is to somehow push back at ELT as an industry because it really is a massive industry. Um, so I'm just going to show you a, a quick demo of one project. I mean, I'm in, involved in trying to promote lots of different open resources um, by great developers out there who are trying to um, provide, you know, opportunities to access English. It's a very um, high stakes uh, language. It, it will enable you to get into jobs, into schools around the world. Um, so that's why there is a huge industry around it. But we can try and break down some of those barriers to access with open resources. I'm just going to show you one, um, if, if you came to my talk this morning, you would have seen an intro to this tool already called the FLEX Language Project. It stands for the Flexible Language Acquisition Project. Um, it's based on open source digital library software, so we call the collections in here libraries um, and collections rather than um, what we might traditionally call corpora or a corpus of language. Uh, there's lots of different collections in here. And what I'd like to also say is, yes, we've made collections of English language resources here, um, but this is a multilingual open source software, so there's no reason why we can't be creating resources in all modern languages. And when I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago in Bologna, OER for languages, we did talk about crowdsourcing. You know, we have, um, we have open content in um, the Wikimedia suite. There's no reason why we can't link up um, these types of open content resources in other languages and connect them to more proprietary resources. Um, so for example, here in Flex, um, we've linked up to the British National Corpus, another corpus called the British Academic Written English Corpus, um, and that's thanks to um, Oxford University Computing Services and the Oxford Text Archive because of their open initiative. It's, very, it's been a very easy um, experience for us to contact um, Oxford and say, hey, look, you've got these resources, um, which, as Melissa mentioned this morning, were traditionally set up by corpus linguists and with a very um, heavily researched, uh, research-focused um, goal attached to them. But, you know, they're also in incredibly valuable resources for language learning and teaching. And of course, um, there's loads of podcasts out there now as well, and there's no reason why we can't be building video and audio corpora. So that is something to look forward to. Um, you might want to watch this space because that's what we're planning to do in future. But I'll just give you a quick demo of um, the Learning Collocations collection. You can see it's a very simple interface. You just enter words. And um, for those of you that don't know, a collocation is essentially just words that occur together in patterns. Um, and this is how native speakers of a language would write or say a word um, in particular combination with other words. So, for example, I'm going to put in um, aging population here. And I'm going to search for this term, aging population. So normally within a, um, a corpus search, you can only put in one word. But here with FLAX, you can put in more than one word, which is really nice. So students can start to search for key topic areas in their, in their field. Um, <coughs> we looked at the B and C this morning. Uh, we've got a choice of three corpora, the BOR, which is this British Academic Written English corpus. And that's a corpus of student writing from the UK. Um, it's about 2,500 examples of student writing from all different subject areas. And this is quite a nice corpus for students of English to be starting with as an achievable goal for the types of language that they should be um, trying to um, trying to produce. Okay, so here we have the aging population. You can see it's spelt in two different ways. Um, and then we drill down into the tool and it will provide us with um, examples. We have a function here where we can save the language and context. So really, when you're studying a language, it's really key to know how that language is being used across contexts. I'll just close that down. 
Now, further down, I didn't show this this morning, but we've also linked to definitions using Wiktionary, related topics in Wikipedia. Here we have re related collocations, um, and this is really based on a tool um, from the FLAX project, which is called the Wikipedia Miner, and it will go through the Wikipedia corpus um, based on the hyperlinks structure and show you which, not only which words are occurring together um, in the fra at the phrase level, but across a whole document or across a whole corpus. So when you look for aging population, it's quite, um, quite common to also have these terms like longevity, pension, expenditure, sustainability, all of these terms to be coming up as well. So we've got some quite cool tools here, sort of pushing at the edge of technological innovation and um, combining open content like Wikipedia content, uh, Wikimedia content with um, traditional corpus resources as well. So that's really what we're trying to do is to enhance resources by linking them and um, to provide students with lots of different contexts to see, okay, how is, how is this language used in the British National Corpus, in a student writing corpus, how is it used in Wikipedia, what do they, what's the definition of Wiktionary, um, later we'll be able to link to podcasts and transcripts of lectures and to show, you know, what are the differences when you're talking about, say, the economic crisis and when you're writing about the economic crisis. So we think these are going to be really good, a good suite of tools for students, especially um, those who are trying to embark on um, higher education or further education studies in um, a language which is not their first language, but there's no reason why we can't be doing this in all modern languages. So that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you. So um, I guess a, a natural thing to do would be to follow with questions, and then we're going to try and set up an interactive task where you can actually play around with the tools. So Tim's got the mic. Anybody have a question for any of the panelists? Gabby. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Gabby from Leicester. I think you all know me. Um, the, the focus seems to be on repositories of OERs at the moment. Is there any further planning or thinking to, um, to assess and accredit students who've studied informally using those OERs, or is it all being used in existing teaching and learning structures and programs? Uh, thank you, Gabby. I'm, this next year, I'm going to be working with the OERU with their college composition uh, module that they're currently putting together as one of their prototype courses. So I'm going to um, be building in some of the FLAX resources um, into that module. And yeah, I think the idea behind the OERU is that we will track how those students use those resources in, in, forming le in formal learning contexts, um, just to see what happens there. Um, so that's one example. Um, well, we, I, think, I think the way in which we're going to um, build the architecture of the different activities uh, around um, open lives would allow relatively easy repurposing and um, would make those materials also accessible for self learners and um, perhaps there is um, an extra layer mm, of OERs that you would need to build in to make those uh, resources um, let's say um, subject to be part of a portfolio for independent learning outside the institution but um, the idea, which is one of the things I wanted to talk about, of uh, the IKEA uh, learning, you know, try to, try to work out very finely all the aspects related to granularity hmm, um, is what would make, actually, these type of materials uh, highly repurposable and, you know, have a great impact. Hmm. So, relatively small things with uh, additional layers that allow people to 
mix and match. I think also on the subject of accreditation, just going talking about the Open Lives project that Antonio and I are working on, um, although it's a little away from your question, um, part of that project is to um, create the OERs and then to actually embed them and integrate them into practice. And I know that um, certainly at Southampton, some of the OERs that are created directly as part of the project and then some of the kind of, uh, you might say, the offshoots from the OERs, the kind of assets that have gone into the OERs, they're going to be created by students uh, and their work will be assessed. So accreditation in, in that kind of sense will be, will be built in um, in terms of students collaborating together and producing material and the material they produce while they're producing that material, uh, that can all be open and that will all be part of uh, an assessment programme as well. But within the Yes, within the course, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jackie from University of Manchester, and you all know me as well. Um, my question really is about transferable uh, lessons from what you've all described. Mm -hmm. So how specific is what you've talked about to teaching languages, and how much of it could be transferred to other communities? Um, because I think collectively you've got so much knowledge between you and I think others could really benefit from that but I'm wondering about how they do that. Uh, just uh, briefly, the, the, we are very lucky in the UK uh, because our departments of uh, modern languages and cultures have got a great um, level of uh, multidisciplinarity. In other countries when you study the degree in Spanish you just study um, a lot of linguistics, uh, a lot of uh, literature, and, uh, and um, you know, that's changing, obviously, but uh, in our departments we have historians who specialize in Spain, sociologists who specialize in Latin America, and so on. So many, many of the things that our students do with language, hmm, connected to the language, can actually be transferred very easily uh, to many other disciplines. And in fact, I would say that um, in terms of uh, learning methodology, mm, there are a lot of things that we use even just in language learning modules mm, where there is not a specific uh, subject or content that are very easily transferable to other subjects. I think language learning is quite advanced in that respect, methodology. Yes, I just wanted to give a reply to, to Jackie as well. Um, and I think there is something a bit specific about languages in the sense that our community of teachers tends to be very much, well, we have a lot of part-time teachers. It's not unique to languages, but it seems to be very much the, the case that <coughs> language teachers tend to have a portfolio career where they might work in different institutions, particularly when Kate was talking about these teachers who teach just maybe one evening class a week. Um, and there is a... I think from, from the experience of Laura and probably Kate's experience as well, I think there is a great thirst for discussion and reflection on pedagogy from this collective. Um, and it becomes less, in our experience, it becomes less about OER and about openness and more about sharing and discussing and reflecting, more about pedagogy. So in a way, I think you know, OER is interesting to us because we do OER but it's not particularly interesting to people who don't do OER. So I think the way to go and where you, you say, you know, we might have some um, experience that's worth transferring, um, I think you need to piggyback the OER onto something else that people really want to do. Um, in the OU, what we, you know, we developed Laura, we put all those resources there, we encourage people to write things and share things things were not always shared where we wanted them to be shared, but nevertheless they were shared, you know, and that's an aspect that you also, it goes a little bit against what we're trying to do, because as researchers and as funded projects, we're very interested in tracking reuse and, and showing impact and being able to demonstrate that, that these things are happening. But the reality of this is that they might be happening, but we just don't know about it. So, you know, through creating Loro, through encouraging reuse, we've ended up where people actually um, reuse and share 
but maybe not in Loro. And that's fine. And I think also it's, it's a slow process. And you talk in the, in the constraints of a two-year project or something, and you're desperate to show some impact in those two years. And I think the impact might be five years down the line. Uh, I just wanted to show you one project that we have um, started recently. This is a, a European project called Performing Languages. Nothing to do with OER. It's basically a drama and, and languages um, project, um, a lifelong learning project. And we're working, the Department of Languages is working with um, three amateur theatre companies in France, Italy and Spain. And we're taking our teachers to these um, to see this, uh, to, to work with these companies uh, and to experience uh, theatre techniques and drama techniques and to think about how they can incorporate that into their own language teaching. And you think, well, what's that got to do with OER? You know, well, it has nothing to do with OER, but an integral part of the project is that if you take part in this project, whatever materials you create are then shared as OER. And there is a, a whole lot of talking about OER, learning how to create OER, learning about find copy, finding copyright clear images, etc., etc. That is just part of the project, but people don't sign up to the project because they want to learn about OER. So I think that's a good example of maybe the way to sell OER to communities. I was very interested to see that one of the um, types of language offered in the list of Italian and Spanish, whatever, was professional English. Mm. And I was, just, I was just thinking that there's incredible potential for OER to act as a leveller when English is being used as a lingua franca. And I was wondering two things. One, whether there's been much interest or collaboration with major corporations, I mean transnational companies, um, companies like Procter & Gamble, for example, or you know, any of the major health companies, because they, they may be doing this kind of thing, but internally, that's one, and that's a very competitive environment, although that is maybe breaking down in the business model because they have supplier partners, etc., and they're beginning to realize, you know, move towards a more collaborative approach. So that's one angle of things. And the other angle of things is whether there's that kind of um, collaboration with um, people who do things rather than big commercial companies. They might be state-run companies so as to facilitate um, basically the, the, the influence of people in, I hate the word developing, you know, we are the ones who should be developing, not developing countries, but um, countries with <coughs> lower resources. You know, so are there any collaborations like that? So that's one side of the question. The other is, to what extent is OER developing in other languages so that we don't have, you know, this neo-colonialist situation where, you know, like the internet, we've disseminated English around the world, now we're doing it through OER. You know, so there's the Open University in China, but to what extent is OER developing in other countries? So a few questions there. English, you want to take English? Um, I can't really answer that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure to what extent, except that uh, to say that there are OER movements, and we've heard a lot from uh, delegates at this conference about OER movements going on in different countries. Um, I have found a lot of it in English. Obviously, being a native English speaker, um, that's, that's where I'm, the area I'm working in. Certainly, as far as uh, Southampton's concerned and our work, um, our next step, uh, so we've had a lot of projects within the UK, uh, and our next step would be very much to go out and work with people in other countries, because we're very conscious, certainly the project I mentioned, the Community Cafe project, um, yeah, we're working in English. Many of the teachers that were involved in that project didn't have a particularly good level of English. Um, and at the time, I found myself thinking, oh, you know, we need to have all of this in Punjabi or, you know, in Swahili or Somali or something like that. Um, and so I think very much for us, that's the next step, to reach out 
and to perhaps take what we've done in the UK as a basis and the learnings from those projects and just go and see how far we can take that into different cultures uh, and different languages um, with the understanding also that obviously different different countries and different cultures have different educational systems and different ways of looking at how they teach and the kind of resources they create and we certainly found that with our community languages teachers in the sense that they had no formal teacher training all they had was if you like was their educational background what they'd experienced at school and we found that to be very very different to how we'd been trained as language teachers so there is that kind of divide to bridge which i think is a very very interesting one and one that certainly at uh, LLS at Southampton we, we're very keen to, to get into. Uh, so if anyone out there is thinking, that sounds interesting, we could have a potential collaborative project, then please speak to me. Um, um, in one of my projects, I'm uh, working with the idea of embedding um, employability in the curriculum. And um, the other day, I was looking now for the reference in my email. Uh, to give you exactly the title. Uh, there is something called the Sir Tim, Sir Tim Wilson Review of Business University Collaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that, um, in that uh, review or report, which came out, uh, I think it was on the 1st of March of this year, um, I was complaining to my colleagues by email as soon as I received it that modern languages and cultures had been treated very, very unfairly because um, they had uh, put linguistic skills at the very bottom, surprisingly, and you know, in, in clear contradiction with many other reports, at the bottom of the needs or the top needs of employers. But at the same time, interestingly, they have they had actually uh, ident when when it came to identifying problems that employers had and specific lack of uh, specific lacks of. Uh, of uh, skills, they said that one of the top things, I think it was the number two, was um, the need to have employees who are able to deal with multicultural situations and work in environments where there are people from different countries and different languages. So uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, they need to put their act together, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, I think there is plenty of room for collaboration. I, I'm actually I actually believe in collaboration. I'm working in that precisely. But, uh, you know, employers themselves need to know, you know, what is the relationship between learning the language and actually uh, having a bit of uh, uh, intercultural skills, which they clearly need for their staff. Can I also just uh, reply to some of those points? Um, Jackie, before in her, in her presentation, picking up from what Antonio is saying, talked about strategically important subjects, and it was languages and quantitative methods. So I think there is a recognition that there is a, a bit of a weak spot there where languages are concerned in this country, talking about the UK. Um, but I think this, this is not just a, an issue that's been identified by the government and so on. It just permeates the whole of higher education. So we create these super open resources and we put them out there for everybody to use as long as they speak English. And we don't think, you know, we think about accessibility in many, in many respects, but it doesn't occur to us that if you don't speak English, you're out, you know, you can't access those resources. And I think it's time now for the OER community to think about how we solve that. Um, I talked to somebody about it and said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting, you know, they said, well, we can translate our resources into Spanish or French or whatever. And I said, yeah, but wouldn't it be interesting also to translate what's being done in France and Spain and, you know, Germany? Oh, we, we have enough content already. We don't need that. <laughs> and I thought it was a very strange reply. You know, what we do is so good and so important that we put it out there so everybody, you know, those poor people outside of the Anglo-American world can, can just get access to our fantastic stuff. We have no interest whatsoever in finding out what they're doing, you know, and the way to find out is by translating that into English. So one of the things we're starting to grapple with is this idea of the open translation practices. And I don't know if anybody's come across the tech talks, the uh, Wikipedia, there's, if you go to TED talks or if you go to Wikipedia, there is a section which is translation. 
And there is a whole community, it's basically crowdsourcing translations from volunteer people who are interested in just translating, translating stuff. And I think maybe somewhere along the line, further down the line in, in our OER efforts, every project is going to have an embedded crowdsourced you know, translation solution so that what you are putting out there, there is a way of turning that into other languages if there is that kind of interest. Um, you know, both from English into other languages and from other languages into English. But I think we're not there by a long way there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll just add to that really quickly. When I was at the Mozilla Festival in London last year, they were working on different widgets and apps that could, to facilitate that direct translation of content that suddenly people were really excited about. So, for example, we had the Stanford Artificial Intelligence um, course, which was a MOOC type course available, and just all of the languages that, that got um, translated into um, immediately just because the content was so valuable to so many people around the world. Um, but yes, I think we do have to be really careful of um, pushing our brand out there. Um, you know, I know University of Nottingham has got the Nottingham Ningbo com uh, campus just outside of Shanghai. Uh, it would be really great to see, um, you know, what of the Chinese context is being fed back into that experience of open Nottingham. Um, that's something I would like to see. Um, so I see you guys up there in the back row, so that'd be great. <laughs> All right, cool, thank you. Yeah, we've got um, five minutes, so any roundup questions or we wanted to do something interactive where we got you to look at the resources <laughs> and then to tweet, um, but that didn't quite happen. Um, but please feel free to do that um, afterwards to, yes, Mark. Hello. Um, I had an idea regarding um, publicity of what you're doing and I'm just presenting it. Um, is it possible to take particular phrases in particular languages that relate to the geography, economic, economics or politics of those areas and somehow compare them in some kind of uh, press release scenario? That's just an idea which has come to me because I, well, I looked at one of these sites and you don't actually have any kind of facility for getting a message out to the press. That's just an idea that I've had. Thank you. I wish, uh, I wish the press uh, was as uh, sensitive and creative as you are. <laughs> <laughs> I had another idea as Mark was talking. It was about, you know, maybe what we should be doing is showing more join up. So instead of just thinking about uh, modern language teaching and, and the sort of stuff you're doing, maybe if we come some of what we did around strategically important subject areas, for example, which have got the ear of government and the press at the moment, and the CBI and big organisations like that, maybe we could be taking some content that has been developed, um, so for example around quant teaching, and translating some of that, because we've had a demand from South America to do that, but we don't have access to people who could do that for us, so maybe we need to be sort of thinking a bit more out of the box about how we could all join up and show real impact. So we're not sort of looking in our uh, subject silos, but we're looking beyond that. Um, I suppose what, I, what I'm saying is really addressing your point here. It's, a bit, it's been a bit more bullish. I think academics have a tendency to be a bit recessive and we hold it to ourselves and we sort of navel gaze a bit. And maybe we need to be a bit more pushing the word out there and being a bit more pragmatic and, and working with people and showing the impact of what we do. Because I, I tweeted, and some of you will have seen my tweet, collectively, you four have such a lot of experience, and yet you're all incredibly humble about it. But the impact of what you've done is pretty huge, actually. But nobody's really measured that in a traditional impact sense, and I think there's a story to be told around that. I think you're all wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> we, we count on you, Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> You'll make us famous. <laughs> all right, everyone, thank you very much for your attendance and for your participation. Thank you.